National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA. And we're happy to co-host this webinar today with Open Channels and EBM Tools Network. Uh, and we're especially happy today to have with us uh, John Bruno from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in the biology department. And I'll introduce him in a second. But before I do, I just want to remind you all that we definitely want to hear from you in terms of your questions and comments. So please go ahead and uh, type those into the Q&A uh, interface on the webinar. Um, or you can use the chat box, either one. And uh, hope, hope to hear from you. And we will have that discussion after John has presented. So uh, John today is going to be talking about how climate change threatens the world's marine protected areas. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thank you, Sarah, for uh, the invitation, and thanks to all of you who are joining us. Um, please uh, enter or type in any questions you have uh, during the presentation, and I'll get to those after 25 minutes or so. So for, why don't I start just by giving you some kind of context or background about how this project came about. So uh, Stephen Ann Strupp um, is uh, the chief scientist for Polar Bears International, and he used to work for the um, USGS as a polar bear scientist. You may remember him as one of the scientists who was speaking out about the impacts of climate change during the Bush administration and being gagged uh, and reprimanded for having done that, um, along with James Hansen. Um, Stephen got the polar bears listed as an endangered species due to habitat loss via ice melting in the Arctic under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And so he had invited Richard Aronson and I up to um, the Arctic to do some outreach with Polar Bears International. So you go out onto the ice and you're kind of with the polar bears as they're getting ready to go out um, uh, onto Hudson's Bay uh, in the fall, just as the ice is kind of freezing up, so they go out to hunt. And we just started talking about um, a really common theme in marine conservation uh, where people view marine protected areas and local conservation as kind of like a tool to mitigate climate change impacts, particularly warming. And I mean, we don't necessarily, well, let me put it another way. We kind of see the problem from the opposite direction. So rather than considering MPAs as a tool against warming, we kind of see warming as a threat to MPAs. Um, and it's not that MPAs are warming more than the rest of the oceans, but it's really that in some cases, MPAs can protect house species that will be especially vulnerable to climate change simply because their populations are very small and often they're geographically limited to kind of existing only within MPAs where protections from hunting, for example, um, kind of like restrict the populations. And that's particularly true, obviously, for uh, higher trophic levels, large predators, where there might just be a few dozen or a few hundred in an MPA, where historically there would be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands kind of spread across a much larger geographic region. So the question was simply, how much will MPAs uh, warm and how does that vary with different emission uh, scenarios and across different latitudes and longitudes? So how much variation is that? Does, is that, um, does that how much does that vary spatially? And so to answer the question, um, we had to combine a global data set on the location of all the world's MPAs. There's just over 8,000 um, in the database that we were able to use. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, the underlying map of projected warming rates. So it's in degrees Celsius per year. Um, and this is for the RCP 8.5 emission scenario. Um, and if you remember, the RCP scenarios are the new social ecological scenarios that came out with um, the IPCC AR4 report. Um, they kind of, they replace those old super confusing A1, B1 scenarios. Um, 8.5 is what's sometimes called the business as usual scenario. So it essentially means there is little to no mitigation. And in fact, emissions rates will either stay constant or increase slightly with an increase in uh, human population size and kind of in increasing energy intensivity uh, with de in, as developing countries become more kind of as their economies become, become more energy intense. Um, so that's what you're seeing as the underlying um, colors on the map. And each dot is the centroid. So just the center of all these 8,000 odd MPAs. 
And so that's one kind of simplified aspect of the analysis. We just kind of considered the center of each MPA. You could do this in a more sophisticated way and kind of integrate across shape files for all the MPAs, um, but that just became way more computationally uh, intensive. Um, so anyway, all you're seeing at the bottom is just kind of zoom ins on a couple of regions of the world. And you obviously can see there's projected, as you're all probably aware, projected greater rates of warming um, in the Arctic and in some portions of the Antarctic. But um, before we go on, I want you to notice we actually have very few, well, relatively few MPAs uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic zones. Um, so th that's going to be why. And in fact, most of them, as you're seeing in the cursor here for the Arctic, are in the relatively low Arctic. So there's really few MPAs in the high Arctic. So you're probably going to see less warming than you might expect in the uh, high latitude regions. And that's, uh, again, because most of the MPAs are in this kind of right near um, this zonal break. And the same is true in the Antarctic. So if we were to have a lot of MPAs, for example, way up here in the high North Atlantic, we would have had much greater values for MPA warming uh, in the Arctic zone. So overall, the results, and these are the results for RCP 8.5, and these are based on the CMIP5 simulation ensembles. This is just a family of simulations. This is all available for um, anybody to download, and it's relatively easy to kind of work with these simulations. Um, all the R code to do that, to extract projections for a specific point or a whole region is all in our GitHub site. And um, I'm happy to help anybody with that if they want to learn how to do that. Um, so the kind of broad take home is that over all these 8,000 MPAs, the rough average for projected warming is about 0 0.034 degrees Celsius per year. And so um, from 2006 to 2100, uh, that's the period that we looked at, we're talking about almost three degrees C war more warming. So exactly the mean is 2.8 C. Um, remarkably, 99% of all MPAs in the database are projected to warm by at least two degrees Celsius. And so this is upper surface warming. Um, so upper surface sea surface temperature warming. And uh, as you'll see in a second, the rates are substantially or at least somewhat lower for RCP 4.5, which is uh, a pretty um, ambitious or optimistic emissions reduction scenario. There's, e there's one even more optimistic uh, scenario that we just think is honestly, it's, it's so unlikely we didn't even include it. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through kind of um, some numerical results. Uh, so this is table one from the paper. Um, and this is the mean values, the, uh, the mean and the standard deviations for RCP 8.5, that it, business as usual, RCP 4.5, the mitigation scenario. And in the first column, this is for fully protected marine reserves, which are a really small subset of all the world's MPA. So just 309 marine reserves we looked at. Uh, sorry about that. And this is for uh, all the MPAs. And what you're seeing here is the predicted, projected warming rates. Um, that's 0.033 for the reserves, 0.035 for all the MPAs, like I just showed you. For tropical MPAs, it's slightly lower, but um, not as much lower as I expected. It's still 0.031. And, and again, that's degrees Celsius per year. It gets a little bit warmer with subtropical, it jumps up and temperate. And then it jumps up to 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per year in the polar MPAs. And again, this value would be presumably much higher if we actually had MPAs in the high, higher Arctic in some regions of the Antarctic. And then for comparison, it drops down to um, 0 0.014 for the uh, mitigation scenario, RCP 4.5. So it's roughly half as much warming. Still substantial warming, but about half as much. And this translates into about 1.3 degrees C of warming by the end of the century on average. Okay, so the biggest challenge with doing this once we kind of just describe the, the base numbers was trying to figure out what the impact would be. And we worked on this for over a, a year, just you know, racked our brains. How can we say how this will matter for 
specific species, for community diversity, for ecosystem functioning. And frankly, it's really hard. Um, I'll show you some stuff at the end. And I think, I mean, one way to do it is simply to look at the impacts we've seen over the last 20 to 40 years via warming and they are substantial and just make a very qualitative projection that, well, if we see 10 times more warming in the future, we can expect those impacts to go up. Um, but we wanted to do something a little bit more concrete than that. And so um, I'm gonna jump ahead for a second, but I'm gonna come back to this graphic. So the top two panels are based on this new concept of year of emergence. And that was uh, described by Stephanie Hansen et al. She's an oceanographer in the UK. And so this in this nature communications paper, they argue that one way to do this, one way to get a sense for how a specific amount of warming or acidification or deoxygenation would impact communities and ecosystem functioning was to look at kind of the degree of variability of any of those characteristics that species, communities are already uh, experiencing via natural, natural seasonal cycles and kind of natural among year variability due to the NAO or the ENSO cycle or whatever, and then project forward when they will experience conditions outside of, of that natural variability. Um, and those projections come from the CMIP or any climate projection models. So once that happens, when they exceed what they've exceeded in the past, they consider that to be essentially a, a threshold and that there will be some type of impact. They don't sp explicitly say what those impacts would be, but presumably they would be declines in populations, probably changes in composition and richness as species fall out because they've exceeded what they are adapted to, um, and certainly a change in overall ecosystem functioning. And so that's what you're seeing in these top two panels. So what we've done is plotted the year of emergence, so the year that a specific uh, marine reserve in this case will deviate from what it's been experiencing uh, over the historical record. And so the blue circles are marine reserves that will deviate from, uh, sorry, ex exceed that threshold in the future. And you can see most will exceed it by the end of the century. And the red circles are ones that have already exceeded that. So they're already experiencing temperatures. The species in these uh, marine, res marine reserves are already experiencing temperatures that they've never experienced historically. Um, and that's all the red circles. The gray circles are uh, all the MPAs. So again, what you see here in the colors are the subset of MPAs that are fully projected that we're calling marine reserves. And obviously there's a, a bit of a pattern here, although it's not statistically significant. It looks like there's a, a later emergence time for the higher latitude marine reserves, um, although it actually works out to a straight line uh, statistically. And uh, also note, we don't have any, any values for the higher latitudes because there's essentially no, no marine reserves in the higher latitudes. So the panel on the left here is the year of emergence for uh, ocean temperature. On the right is the year of emergence for deoxygenation. So oxygen variability that they experience seasonally or interannually. Um, and again, most, uh, well, essentially all the marine reserves will deviate from what they've experienced by the end of the century, um, mainly just in the coming decades, and uh, about a third already have. All right, the bottom two panels are kind of a different approach. And these are based on a really important paper by Rick Stewart Smith et al. So this was in Nature uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so this is based on uh, Rick Stewart Smith and Graham Edgar's Reef Life Survey. So they work with volunteer science, volunteers and scientists internationally to survey reefs, both coral reefs and temperate rocky reefs. And they survey fish, invertebrate composition, et cetera. And it's thousands of surveys. It's super high quality data. So it's kind of the gold standard for regional to global scale monitoring at this point in shallow subtidal environments. And doing this, they're able to, to piece together the geographic extent of all the constituent species from all of these sites. So they then use the geographic extent to predict 
um, essentially the thermal niche, what temperatures that these species are able to tolerate. And there's pretty good evidence that geographic extent is a good predictor of uh, thermal tolerability, despite the fact that obviously other factors control geographic distributions, things like predators, competitors, um, et cetera, resource availability. So they use that to project uh, how much warming an individual species could tolerate. In doing that, you can then create uh, what's called the community thermal safety margin. So how much warming the average species in a community could tolerate before its thermal tolerance was exceeded and then it presumably would fall out of the community. And so that's what these, uh, the bottom two graphics are based on. So these are community thermal safety margins averaged for all the MPAs within different ecoregions at different latitudes. So each point is kind of a, it's a, it's a mean for all the MPAs within the ecoregion and again, those means are based on the average species living in communities with inside those MPAs and how, how much warming they can tolerate. And it ranges from like three to eight degrees Celsius, how far communities kind of lie away from their, their tolerance. Um, and the important point is that it varies a lot um, geographically. So it's substantially greater um, at higher latitudes. And again, we're plotting the year of exceedance. So when they will exceed, um, not the natural variability as in the top two panels based on Henson et al, but the community thermal safety margin. And so um, in some, it goes all the way up to uh, like more than 200 years out from now. For some, they're going to exceed that in the coming decades, mostly the tropical environments. And so the point is, the take home is that higher latitude MPAs, and in this case at the grain of ecoregions, have substantially more time before the average species exceeds its thermal safety margin in that community. And that is not due to geographic variability in warming rate, but instead due to geographic variability in the inherent community thermal safety margin, and that's what you're seeing in panel D here. So, um, species at higher uh, latitudes have a lot more, can warm much more before they exceed the, uh, the estimated uh, kind of safety margin. So the safety margin is only uh, less than, in many cases, less than a half a degree Celsius uh, near the tropics and lower latitudes, and it's up to three, five, all the way up to seven degrees at higher latitudes. And that gives us a sense for how these impacts might vary geographically with warming, how different MPAs in different regions might be more susceptible. Okay, uh, another thing we did was to simply ask, what are the spatial patterns in the two main factors that we looked at, deoxygenation and warming? And again, this is based on the time of exceedance and for the top, we've plotted that for RCP 8.5, the business as usual. At the bottom, are for RPC 4.5, the mitigation scenario. Um, the lilac is for uh, the deviations from oxygen concentration. And so what you're actually seeing is refugia, where oxygen concentration changes are relatively modest and do not exceed uh, species tolerances. For orange, you're seeing that for temperature, and for red, you're seeing temporary refugia for both uh, physical characteristics. And so we're simply asking, where in the world should we put MPAs to avoid warming? And of, of course, people focus a lot on that for temperature, um, but it hadn't been done too much for um, deoxygenation. And so what these results are showing is those are more or less non-overlapping places. So if you were to look for a uh, refugia from temperature, um, that's a different place and you'd be looking for a refugia from, de for, from deoxygenation. And the red are places that are refugia from both factors. 
Um, and obviously that's relatively small portions of the ocean. And so far there's very little overlap with where existing MPAs are. That's what you're seeing with the black. And I think that's a really important point. So we can't just optimize MPA placement based on temperature. Personally, I think deoxygenation is going to be almost as big of a problem um, for a lot of parts of the ocean. And so we really have to take that into account as well. Um, another way to look at this was to simply ask, uh, 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 well, actually, I'm going to jump ahead on this and show you this slide instead. So we simply asked, um, are uh, there more MPAs in ecoregions that are warming less? So, you know, we all currently are trying to put MPAs in, in spatial refuges where there's less warming. And so we simply looked at the number of MPAs in ecoregions. And on the x-axis here is the rate of warming in the ecoregion. And there's um, obviously not a negative relationship is what you'd expect. So we're actually putting more or the same number of MPAs in places that are warming. So the take home from this is that we are so far not effectively placing NPAs in locations that are projected to warm less. And finally, uh, we did uh, look also at pH. We had planned to look at kind of all three factors, um, but as Henson et al. found in their paper, pH has already uh, exceeded the natural toler the natural variability for essentially every marine reserve on Earth. So we didn't even bother to analyze that because it's, it's frankly not that interesting. It doesn't vary very much across latitude, but it is really striking to see how long ago we've already exceeded natural variability in pH for all the world's MPAs and marine reserves. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the model we use was uh, the, the kind of a native coarse grain model. And these are the projections I've already shown you. And on the right side, we also were able to use a, a downscaled model that our co-author uh, Ruben developed, but it only goes to 45 degrees north and south. So we couldn't use it for uh, the entire analysis. And what I'm showing you here is there's some variability in terms of overall projected warming between the downscale model and the native model for RCP 8.5. It's, it's essentially, well, it's, it's non-existent for RCP 4.5. And this is just showing you the distribution of warming for 4.5 and 8.5, and then for the downscale of 4.5 and 8.5. There's some differences, there's some geographic differences, but they're relatively small, so we kind of discounted them and just went with the analysis based on the coarse grain model. All right, so the, the final point I want to make is that, uh, it, I mean, as you're all probably aware, we're already seeing large, really profound, in many cases, effects of warming on marine protected areas and fully protected marine reserves. And currently, kind of the most... Um, uh, notable or iconic cases, the Great Barrier Reef, the warming that was seen in 2016 and 2017. So the GBR kind of runs along here off Northwest Australia. Um, it's about a thousand kilometers long. And this is the, the amount of warming during 2016 in degree heating weeks. So that's just the number of weeks um, in the prior year where ocean temperatures were essentially a degree Celsius warmer than usual. So we got into some really high degree heating wakes up in the northern GBR. Uh, a threshold of four to eight is thought to trigger mass bleaching of uh, reef building corals. And a really important point is not only is this designated as a marine reserve in a World Heritage Site, but this is some of the world's most pristine and isolated marine habitat. So very few people live up here. There's a very little fishing, almost no uh, impacts from uh, local communities in part because the reefs are so far offshore, um, but there's just very little going on. So these are some of the world's best protected reefs and marine ecosystems. And yet, due to this warming, there is massive coral cover loss. So um, uh, really heavy coral cover loss, almost uh, total bleaching and uh, loss of, in the shallow water reef building corals and the northern GBR. Um, and that's the second time that's happened on the GBR. Um, and it's not only the GBR, there's a number of other highly isolated, very well protected marine reserves 
um, that were also heavily impacted by bleaching in 2016. Uh, this is work from NOAA. Um, so Rusty Bernard just published this paper. This is really sad. Uh, Jarvis is considered uh, also one of the world's most pristine, healthy, uh, isolated marine coral, uh, coral reefs. And in 2016, due to the bleaching, essentially lost all of its coral. So coral covers just one or two percent now. Uh, same deal in the Chagos. So these are totally isolated. Nobody living within tens or hundreds of kilometers of most of these reefs, fully protected, no to very little, little, little fishing. And yet, uh, due to the 2016 bleaching, coral cover was down to about uh, five to 8%, depending on the reserve. So we're already seeing these massive impacts of warming on MPAs. And I'm obviously just showing you corals, but they're affecting everything, marine uh, birds and mammals, a whole slew of invertebrates, uh, fish communities, et cetera. So it's not just corals that are being impacted. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead here. And uh, I don't know, I'd like to end on an optimistic note. I'm not even really sure what that is, other than the belief that I think it's still feasible that uh, we avoid the worst outcomes of future warming simply by uh, mitigating our emissions. So I, unlike a lot of my friends and colleagues, have not given up on outright mitigation getting down to very close to zero net carbon emissions by at least mid-century. And with that, I think I wanted to stop and take questions. Okay, thank you, John. Um, great presentation, lots of food for thought. And I encourage people to go ahead and, and type in your questions. I see some of you are doing that. Uh, so first of all, there was a question about the article being available for download. Yes, it's, uh, there's a link, the very first slide right here. Just click this link. We, uh, Lauren, will we share the, the Yes, we will. So okay. people can also get a copy of this presentation and we'll make sure that uh, the link is available. Yes. Okay, and I'll type it into the chat panel uh, as if you can leave it up there for a second, John. I'll leave it up there and um, I'll also put it up on Twitter for anyone that follows me on Twitter at, at John F. Bruno and it's also available on ResearchGate. So a lot of places you can get it. Great, thank you. All right, so... Starting off the questions uh, from Randy McClay, uh, my first question is, are there any mitigation efforts to help preserve the value of these areas as mitigators since changing carbon levels in the atmosphere is likely going to take some time? <sighs> I, you know, uh, so the only really optimistic, I think unproven uh, approach would be um, just restricting fishing as much as possible under the assumption that larger uh, populations are better able to adapt to changing environmental conditions. Um, that's honestly, that's really the only thing I think we can do in terms of increasing the resilience of the populations that are in MPAs to uh, climate change. Well, and along those lines, I think there is a, uh, a message that some MPA programs and managers are, are saying, and you were, you alluded to this at the beginning of your talk uh, about the idea that MPAs can promote resilience to climate change. Do you think that that is a, an effective or, or a defensible message? I, <laughs> this is controversial. I don't. Uh, but I'm really focused on corals, right? So in terms of corals, I think the evidence is exceptionally clear that local protection does nothing for increasing coral community resilience to ocean warming. Um, that said, I can't really speak to whether it's effective for, you know, seabirds or all kinds of other species that I know, you know, little to, about, to be honest, Lauren. Okay. Um, I have another question here from Makaya Gomat, who asks, do you expect marine life to be able to adapt to changing temperatures? Oh, God, that's such a, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's really good evidence that most probably almost all species are adapting and acclimatizing to changes in oxygen, pH, and temperature. Uh, but the big question is, what is the, what are those rates? And that's such a big unknown. I mean, there's a huge army of people trying to work on that, trying to quantify rates and predict rates of adaptation. 
uh, but it currently it's really hard to come up with numbers. And I guess the main question is, can they adapt fast enough? And I'm really skeptical that they can. I mean, I find it really hard to believe that most species will be able to adapt to one or two or three degrees Celsius warming. I mean, that's just a massive amount of warming. And species certainly are adapted to temperature, but it usually takes, you know, hundreds of years, not just a couple of years or a couple of decades. So I'm skeptical that we'll see enough adaptation to kind of head off big impacts. So that's why I think our really only hope is uh, emissions mitigation. So here's a question from Mark Eakin. Are you aware of any MPA that has taken climate change into account in its placement? I am not, and maybe Mark is, and that's not to say that there isn't one. I'm, I mean, I'm almost sure of if there's 8,000 that's one or some have, but I am not aware of one that has. I mean, that's in part because a lot of times there's no scientific, well, little scientific input given into MPA placement. I mean, obviously it's a political process, so all kinds of uh, parties have input on where it's going to be, um, but no. I, I'm not Mark, sorry. And I would just add uh, that when Papahanaumokuakea was expanded, climate was cited as part of the rationale. For as the, a rationale, uh, yeah, for sure. Right, right. Um, it, it, because it provided such a diversity of habitats and uh, you know, um, expansion of depth and things like that. So that's the only one that comes to mind immediately for me as well. Yeah, definitely as a rationale, but not necessarily like where it would be, you know, like, like we didn't choose Papa because of, you know, uh, it's going to warm less than other places, although it is. I think we chose it, right, because it's isolated and unique and important and biodiverse, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah, certainly the, the kind of mapping that you've shown here, I haven't seen uh, applied in any planning process. And I yeah. think it's going to provoke a lot of thinking among MPA planners, uh, particularly those who are scrambling to meet this Aichi term. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, here's another question from Coyer Woolston, who asks, um, Considering the MPAs slash reserves have significant potential in augmenting ecosystem resilience to global stressors, such as ocean warming and oxygen depletion, isn't there still a good argument to create marine reserves in areas where they will be strongly influenced by global stressors? For ecosystems that will inevitably be impacted by such warming and oxygen depletion, protecting ecosystems from local stressors through the use of MPAs may be our only solution. So absolutely. I think, so the, the message and the results from this paper, I don't think in any way suggest that we should not create, expand marine reserves. So um, I, I mean, I think there's a million reasons to have a lot of MPAs and certainly far more no-take marine reserves than we already have. Um, in part because it's not just ocean warming that's impacting marine ecosystems, right? I mean, most of the reefs I work at, yes, there's obvious impacts of warming and bleaching, but by far the biggest impact is fishing. You know, most of the reefs in the Caribbean I work at, there's no sharks, there's no grouper, there's no predators. 90% of the biomass has been removed by overfishing. So certainly MPAs play a really important role in current day conservation of a lot of these environments. And going into the future, even if so, so we're unable to mitigate emissions um, or we're not able to mitigate emissions as much as we want, there's still going to be stuff there. Like it won't be what it is today. You know, you'll, you'll see a total different uh, assemblage. You'll see species moving in as, as species that are currently there go extinct. But in most places, there'll still be something there. In fact, there's been some really interesting analysis that, su that suggests that in a lot of higher latitude, kind of subtropical to temperate environments, diversity is going to go way up as tropical migrants kind of move to higher latitudes, tracking their thermal envelope. So you could see a lot more species living off of Monterey Bay, California, or North Carolina in 50 years than you do now. So that's a great reason to have the MPAs, because we want to protect those species from local impacts, just like, you know, we protect the current species today. That doesn't mean we're preserving, like, what's exactly there, though, right? Right. So, and did you see in your analysis a, a benefit to marine reserves as opposed to other types of MPAs? No, we didn't even look at that, no. Okay. okay. Um, but your, your point about the location of MPAs uh, makes me uh, ask the question, 
I realize this is straying into the policy realm, but I, I couldn't help but think that that the tropics are going to suffer the greatest impacts and the temperate areas are going to be relatively better off, and yet the reverse is true in terms of the contributors to the climate problem. In terms of like human population. And, and emissions, yes. And emissions, right, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and I, I, I guess I'm just making that comment, and then the other is that, uh, of course, food security may also be an issue in terms of impacts. Of yeah, absolutely. So um, anyway, I, I think you, you've opened a, a, a huge uh, realm of discussions on the policy side that, that I'm sure will, will follow from this kind of analysis. Um, okay, so getting back to some of the, um, the other questions from our listeners here, uh, Ava Lisa asks, are there any examples of an MPA that show through active management uh, a reduction of the impacts of global warming? So not, I would argue not coral reefs and I only say that because I'm just, I have a, a review and a meta-analysis on that in press. And I would argue there's no tropical coral reef MPA that has shown a reduction in impacts. However, there's a really great review article in PNAS. Um, remind me, Lauren, who was the first author of that? Um, Callum Roberts, right? Roberts et al. in PNAS? I believe was, so. Yeah, with Jane Lubchenco and a couple of other people. So they have a, you know, not core specific, very general review, both of evidence for increased resilience and a lot of ideas about how MPAs might improve resilience. I mean, things that haven't been tested or maybe there's only like a few studies or conflicting information. So I would refer you to look at that. And I think it's um, open access. So I think it's Roberts et al. 2017. It's actually cited at the end of our, the last paragraph of our paper, if you uh, can't find the citation. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, and a question from Annette Narzinski, who asks, have you collaborated with researchers who work on potential coral refugia and assisted colonization or assisted evolution? No, not, not directly. But of course, all three of those are really exciting topics in the field, especially assisted evolution. So I don't work on that, but obviously there's some, a lot of people doing really neat work on that, as well as on the refugia. I mean, there's um, work coming out just in the last couple of weeks on where coral reef refugia should be. Um, and I think that's really cool work. The only point is, like I said before, those studies aren't really considering uh, acidification and deoxygenation and other change, other aspects of climate change. So they're really just focused on temperature at this point. And getting back to the question about whether people are looking at climate and planning MPAs, uh, Adrian Dahoud is saying, uh, we are using ice models in the Antarctic to look at MPA placement. Oh, cool. Wow. And I, I of course, have also heard from World Wildlife Fund, who's been focusing on trying to get additional protection for what they're calling the last ice area in the Arctic uh, between Canada and Greenland. So that there is some work, particularly in the polls, it sounds like, that, that's looking at this more carefully. That's great. And, you know, to the questions I just got about refugia, so going back 10 or 20 years, a lot of us thought that places that hadn't yet warmed for example, the Northern Great Barrier Reef. We, uh, many people thought that was a climate refugia because it had not warmed. And we assumed that was due to some local oceanographic feature. And so the argument was like, that's gonna be one of our refugia and look what happens. And one of the really scary things about these warming blobs that occur during a lot of our marine heat waves is they seem to move around. So, you know, 30 years ago, I think we all thought they would keep reoccurring in a specific place, again, due to oceanography. And that's, definitely not the case. So every time the GBR experiences mass warming, it's in a different place. Mark's shown the same exact thing for the Caribbean. So those Caribbean warm spots that emerge every three to five years are moving in around to different regions. So I think we've become a lot less confident in our ability to project refugia than we were maybe 30 years ago. So that's one thing I worry about. Like we, it looks like a refugia now, but in 20 years it might not. Yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting point. So, uh, I do you know if there's there's work going on to try to better understand these these heat blobs and where they occur. 
Mark would be a great person to answer that. I don't know, and I think that when I've talked to oceanographers and, and climate modelers about this, my sense is that they are really far from even understanding, even in a hind casting way, like why did this warm blob occur in this location, you know, 10 years ago? So I don't think we have a mechanistic understanding of what moves the kind of spatial extent of the heat waves around, at least at some scales. So I don't know that we're really accurately projecting them forward yet. And, you know, it's, you don't realize this, but it's pretty small scale. So we do have a study that analyzed the spatial extent of the, the heat waves or heat blobs. And it's small. It's like 70 kilometers square was the median size of the warming blobs that have appeared on tropical reefs over like the last 30 years. You know, when you hear about a warming event, you kind of just picture this, you know, mass area of homogeneous warming, but it's really spotty. And I think that's what's kind of complicating these kind of MPA placement efforts. Mm -hmm. So comment from Risa Smith, who says, the message I get from your talk is that there's an argument for creating protected areas under uh, a category specifically related to refugia from climate change. Um, I wouldn't make that argument, no. I mean, a lot of people do, so I'm not discounting it, but that's not, um, what I, that's not an argument that we made in the paper, or that's not an outcome I see from the study. In I've fact, I think, to, go, no, ahead. go ahead. Please go ahead. No, it's all right. I was just going to say, if we see this as a, a, as a significant threat, which I think the paper clearly lays out that it is, why wouldn't we want to do that? I guess, maybe I misunderstood the question, but I guess that our result suggests that it would be really hard to optimize placement unless you were able, I mean, there's very few places that are refuge, refuges from both uh, deoxygenation and temperature. So I guess in theory, you could put things there, but you know, very few of them cover a lot of key habitats. So maybe very few would even cover coral reefs or kelp forests or seagrass beds. There are a lot of open ocean um, areas that meet both of those two criteria. Does that make sense? I, it does, yes. Although I have a follow-up question to that, but sure. while I do that, um, I'm going to ask if folks have other questions, please go ahead and continue to send those in. So, and, and this may be uh, rather basic, so why is there not more of a connection between temperature and deoxygenation if, if uh, Cold water holds more oxygen. Why aren't we seeing more of a connection there? That's an awesome question. And I don't have a great answer because I asked the same question of, uh, of Stephanie because I assumed the same thing. I just thought it was all about, I thought the oxygenation was only driven by change in temperature. And it turns out that it's not, it's also, well, it's affected by that. But the, the bigger effect from my understanding is changes in stratification and surface mixing and things like that. In fact, Sarah could probably comment on that. I was um, about to say stratification is okay. one big, yeah, and then upwelling uh, or lack thereof is, is another big factor. But that's surprising, isn't it, to see that it's pretty discoupled from just straight up warming. Yeah, I was surprised, yeah. And Lauren, did you see the, there was a question from Kara Ball in the yep. Q&A? Yes, thanks. I was going to go there next. Um, so you mentioned that you had fo mostly focused on corals, John, but this is a broader question, if you can comment. What role can MPAs play in providing resilience for human communities, including protection from sea level rise, storm surge, flooding in the communities, et cetera? And can they be promoted this way? Yeah, to an extent, but again, specifically to corals, there's so far no evidence that local management effectively protects corals at all. I mean, coral loss is not any less in MPAs worldwide. Corals don't recover any more quickly within MPAs. Coral cover is not any greater in MPAs. So, so far, we at least have not figured out how to design or implement or enforce MPAs to effectively protect coral to therefore maintain those functions like coastal protection. But obviously, there's lots of other ecosystem services that they can, right? So food security, tourism would be hugely important to a lot of local communities. So I'm not suggesting that like they have no benefits, obviously, for, you know, ecosystem services that people receive. I just came back from the Galapagos over the weekend. And, you know, the, the reason the economy there is booming is totally because of tourism. Everybody wants to go to see hammerhead sharks and sea lions. And, you know, that's purely a function of the MPA. So without the local protections, like you wouldn't have those kinds of things. So, you know, I certainly don't mean to argue that MPAs are ineffective in, you know, providing services to people. So again, I'm going to 
call out to our, our listeners here and ask you if you have other, other comments or questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll continue to ask mine since there's so many things to ask. Um, so I think one of, the, uh, one of the questions that your work poses is kind of how much should people who care about marine biodiversity be focused on MPAs versus, for example, climate. And I realize people have their specialties and they're doing their jobs, but um, it's, it, one could draw the conclusion that if you really care about marine biodiversity, you really just need to focus on climate. And I guess I would like to hear what you think about that. So I personally don't draw that conclusion. I, I mean, I'm strongly an advocate of local protection MPAs, marine reserves. I want to see a lot more of them. I want to see them a lot bigger. And I certainly want to see better enforcement and planning. Um, I, our only, well, it, the specific point of this paper is simply a warning that warming is going to really set back all the progress we've made, and I hope all the progress we make in the you know, coming years and decades in local protection via NPAs. Um, that said, I totally agree with you that we, if we don't deal with warming, you know, we're gonna lose that. So it's really, you know, we've got two problems. So I'm not arguing that it's either or. I guess I'm arguing that it's all of the above. So I don't think we'll get anywhere with only local protection, only for example, MPA implementation. So I think it's critical that we mitigate emissions, that we drastically reduce emissions, you know, really quickly, really extensively. Um, but that I think it's fine for different people in the community to focus on different things. You know, some people are really good at implementing local MPAs and monitoring and enforcing them. And there's other people that are, you know, really advocating for emissions reductions. And I think it's fine that we specialize on those different things. Thanks. Okay, we have a comment from Mark Eakin who says, a problem with citing MPAs where we think there will be less warming is what if we're wrong. Another approach we recently published uses modern portfolio theory to develop a set of coral protected areas that are either uncorrelated or anti-correlated. And then he provides a link. Great, thanks Mark. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I kind of made that point earlier. So, Lauren, there's a couple questions before that, or comments before that as well, that are new. Before that comment? Right, prior to Mark's. Flo was ah, mentioning okay. the important. Yeah. Skip? Ah, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have from e Eva Lisa. Uh, is there any single projection for each of the 8,000 MPAs that shows the local development of the temperature increase and its factors influencing it so that local management might be adapted to this projection? Can you, can you either translate or repeat that for <laughs> I'm me? I'm trying more? to translate that myself. Um, I, I think it's, is there any information, anything available that individual, any of these 8,000 MPAs can go look at to see how much temperature is supposed to rise in their particular MPA? I get it. That's an awesome question. You know what? I thought about doing that, creating some kind of resource because it'd be fairly easy to do. It's just like a table, essentially. Um, I don't know, Sarah, you guys work at the MPA Center. Would that be a valuable thing to put up somewhere as an interactive tool or just like an Excel table? Well, that would be Lauren. Yeah, uh, for the yeah. MPA Center, I could say I think it would be awesome. I was thinking the same thing. I hadn't yeah. translated that in quite that way, but you're right, Sarah. Um, when I saw that global map, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if it was uh, something that people could zoom in on their area and see what the, what the outlook is? Yeah, just click on it because, yep. yeah. Yeah, I think that would yeah, be let's easy. talk about that, Laurie, because, you know, Brian Inquist is part of this platform that's being built where you can do that for a, a terrestrial forest. So you can, like, click on a forest and see what the projected t increase in temperature is, uh, changes in rainfall patterns, and then, try, and then they're even getting to where they are predicting changes in tree composition based on, like, those projections. And, yeah, that would be really neat to do for temperature. And it wouldn't even necessarily have to be MPA-specific. It could just be the projected... Uh, climate models and you click on a, a grid cell, you know, where you want to see and it should tell you, right, boom, this is the projected temperature increase. Yeah, well, we, we're talking a lot these days about, um, you know, helping MPAs do vulnerability assessments and better understand what their predicted climate impacts are. And I think 
that is a tool that a lot of MPAs would be very interested in because right now they're having to try and figure out the climate models and the climate literature and these are folks who you know that's not that's not their specialty okay let's talk about that yeah that would be great um, so another question uh, from Annette Mazursky is that flow has been shown to be an important component in coral survival and growth would you be able to model flow rates reliably and would they be at all predictable to model in the future oh my god I don't I totally agree that it's really important I don't think you I, I'm almost sure you could could not at this scale, right? So this is like a global scale and flow varies enormously at the scale of like, you know, meters or centimeters. So no, I don't think you could do that at, at this kind of scale. All right, I'm just taking a quick scan here to make sure we haven't missed any here. Uh, okay, here's a couple more. Okay, a comment from Nina Dropko, who says, as scientists, we need to address the impacts of animal agriculture instead of focusing solely on mitigating emissions. I don't know if you have any comment on that, John. Yeah, and I guess is the, is the point that animal agriculture is an important cause of carbon emissions? Is that what you take, Lauren? The, that is what I would interpret, yeah. So yeah. That, no, to I, me, that would be part of mitigating emissions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you were to ask me, like, well, what are, how do you mitigate emissions? I mean, absolutely. I would say, like, you know, no more hamburgers, right? So that's like, you know, deforestation due to uh, cattle growing for burgers and steaks is a significant you know contributor i think it's like 10 to 14 percent estimated to be of global emissions so absolutely that's one of you know a dozen things we need to do to to mitigate emissions there, there's been some interesting outreach done on what individuals can do about climate and i think the point being that the the you know led light bulb that most people kind of associate is not the the answer and it's kind of a very interesting focus on lifestyle it's things like have a one fewer child or don't have a car at all. Um, so they're, they're much more dramatic. And then of course, um, not eating meat is also up there. Uh, but they're, they're certainly more significant than I think a lot of people recognize. Uh, okay, uh, another comment, uh, a suggestion, make a, a Google Earth tool of the global trend in sea surface temperature. I can do that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, great. Like you have some people who are ready to put their brains into this. Wonderful. And then um, we have a, a comment from uh, Joanna Scheffler who says, NOAA as a government agency might not be able to speak to this, but should the current drive to open so much of the continental shelf to offshore drilling go ahead? What will the result to the protection of MPAs be? Maybe not necessarily an immediate climate issue, but basically removing the protected status. John, I don't well, know if you prefer to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe you do. I'm happy to, so I have two thoughts on that. One, I mean, I think we just need to stop drilling and leave it in the ground. I mean, we, we actually just sent a letter to Jerry Brown, governor of California, despite the fact that California has you know, been a great leader and, you know, uh, smart climate policy, um, we think that we, California needs to stop drilling. And whether it's like, you know, California, North Carolina, offshore, we just think we need to leave it in the ground. And there's no point in developing new oil fields that frankly will be obsolete in 20 to 30 years. So even economically, I don't think it makes any sense. Um, but uh, kind of a part of that question was whether MPAs can prevent that. And currently they can, but as you all probably know, or some of you, the administration is, is um, already arguing that that's going to change. And even some of our national monuments could be opened up to mineral extraction and commercial fishing. So that's going to be, I think, a big fight in the coming months and years over, you know, whether their administration is successful in scaling back some of the protections that we already have in national marine reserves and, and, and monuments and sanctuaries. In fact, we just published a paper that argues that it would be illegal for the administration to ch make any changes to existing sanctuaries and reserves. That was based on um, kind of this really fun collaboration between attorneys and legal scholars and economists and ecologists. That's great. Well, I think you're highlighting uh, an important point that we hear in a lot of these webinars, which is the, um, the key role of cross-disciplinary collaboration on some of these big questions that we have. So uh, one last um, question here, and this is more in the specifics. 
uh, asking, I know you did not look at this in detail, but is there any significance that the stats that showed the year of emergence with regard to PhD being outside normal variability occurred far in the past? So they're basically asking, what, what does it mean that we've, that we've passed the year of emergence, you know, so long ago with respect to pH? Oh, I think it, well, I think it ecologically means that we probably have been, well, we've, we're way past the baseline. So we are, the assumption, right, is that we are already seeing lots of effect, we, lots of effects of acidification have already happened in some locations decades ago, right? And of course, nobody was looking at that. Even today, there's just not a lot of work on impacts of OA. Um, so I think that's the ecological take home. But that's not to say, so once you cross the threshold, right, it doesn't mean that there won't be any further impact. So acidification is increasing. So presumably, so will impact. So it's not to say there's not like, that it's not a threat going forward. All right, and we're going to end on a policy note here. We have a question from June Sresta, who is asking uh, about the letter to the governor that you mentioned, John, and whether that's public and who signed it. Yes, it is public. Um, it was, uh, if she's on Twitter, it was all over Twitter. So if it was put out by the Center for Biological Diversity, that's CBD. So I'm sure if you looked on their website, um, but I will also tweet that out in like the next five minutes or so. And again, my Twitter's uh, at John F. Bruno. So I'll tweet out that and the link to the paper. And other, well, it's got a list of the signatories. Um, so one that comes to mind is Ken Calderia. So there's a lot of like big name climate scientists and a lot of California climate scientists that signed it. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much, John. This has been really thought provoking. And I want to thank all of our participants and the great questions that people provided. And we will have a recording of the webinar at Open Channels, and we'll also post the, um, the PowerPoint itself. So thanks very much. Thank you all. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.